guys. If you're just joining us uh, today, I'm interviewing Daniel Way. Daniel is one of Barford and Thompson's star performers, uh, consistently top 50 in the company. And that is no mean feat. Barford and Thompson is a massive organization. So uh, we've got 1,700 licensees. Consistently being in the top 50 is an incredible performance for anybody, not to mention a young man of only 27. Uh, Daniel got into real estate at 20 as an associate to his mother and quickly took that business, not from his mother's business, but actually into his own iteration of it. And now is selling with his wife as an associate and they hold the position of number two sales partnership uh, for the Eastern suburbs in Auckland. Uh, Daniel, uh, I know that for you, um, real estate seems very simple and I, I, I want to keep it um, to um, the places that you can kind of take that simplicity and just give us some simple answers. So what, when you approach a new purchaser or a new client, what's, what's the thought in your mind? Um, to put it simply, if we speak about purchases, um, most of the times, uh, if we're meeting them in person, we meet them at a private viewing or an open home. Um, to get the conversation going, uh, I always ask, how did you find us? Uh, it's useful to know uh, for many reasons. And um, that kind of gets the conversation going. Um, if they're meeting, meeting us at a property, uh, then some other questions I like to um, follow up with is essentially, you know, if they're pre-approved, um, if the property is within their budget, all that simple stuff. Uh, but the purpose of it is essentially to qualify them. Um, it's, I think it's really important uh, in our business to um, to make sure that we're um, making the most of our time. There's a lot of opportunity um, in the business to uh, be pretty wasteful with our time. So qualifying, uh, whether it's a purchaser or a seller, uh, is very important um, because you know once you kind of figure out or sift through who the genuinely keen ones are or not, um, then that's where you can kind of make sure you spend the uh, most time with the right people. That's, um, that's a massive lesson. It's easy to feel like people are wasting your time, but you let people waste your time if you're not actually qualifying. Thinking about the current environment we're in, and there's been some massive shifts there, bringing uncertainty for buyers, sellers. How do you intend to navigate that? Um, yeah, I think you used the right word. So um, I think a big effect that the pandemic uh, is, is causing, besides the economic uh, impacts, is that um, when it applies to the real estate market, uh, the key word is uncertainty. So for buyers, they're not sure if it's the right time for them to be committing to anything. Uh, and for sellers, again, it's the same thing. It's, they're not sure if it's the right time for them to be getting uh, the best value uh, for their property. So whether or not that is or isn't true, um, that's the whole point. Um, and I think our role uh, is to, well, I'm making my role uh, to be just the trusted advisor that they can kind of lean on uh, anytime they have any questions. Um, I think the goal, yeah, that's, that's really my main strategy going into things. Um, whether the conversation um, goes in a way where they decide to or not to sell, um, that's fine. But I think it's really key um, for the like longevity of business, just to be that genuine trusted person that they can uh, rely on for sure. That's a huge point. You don't go in with an agenda to try and convince them that they should be selling or that they should be buying, but your agenda is actually to be the trusted advisor, helping them to make good decisions. For sure. I think that's one of the uh, biggest things people um, appreciate um, about a good trusted real estate advisor uh, because uh, you, you oftentimes, I guess there's a bit of a, um, the stigma comes from uh, people that have bad experiences with agents and that's where the stigma comes from. And on the flip side, when you can be that genuine, just um, genuine trusted person uh, that's not pushy or anything like that, uh, people think, oh, golly me, <laughs> not so bad. And they really do appreciate it, um, for sure. Yeah. And if I can add to that, uh, you know, this is, as we've talked about, quite uncertain. Mm. Um, but part of the strength of being a trusted advisor is asking good questions. Mm. People in um, 
conflict or stress, um, in which some are under huge stress at the moment, tend to respond emotionally rather than rationally. And it may be by actually asking some good questions, helping them to become clearer on their current situation and what the options are is a big part of being a trusted advisor. Yeah, um, sure. Daniel, have you got any other tips that you could give to, um, I guess, your colleagues at the moment in terms of handling uncertainty in their own businesses? Mm. Um, again, my approach to things is to keep uh, it fairly simple. Um, I know of many different people that are in, um, yeah, um, they're, they're not in the uh, best financial position uh, from say either losing their jobs because of the pandemic or whatever. So I think it is a very sensitive time. And because it's such a sensitive time, just to be um, sensitive with uh, people, um, be understanding uh, when people might not be seeing uh, reason uh, that maybe we can see very clearly. Um, for sure. So that would be my biggest one. Empathy will go a very long way um, in this market. Just be understanding uh, and pretty patient uh, with people because, uh, again, uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of people in different situations. Um, yeah. No, thanks, Daniel. Uh, a few other thoughts, um, just building a little bit on what you've already talked about. The importance of qualifying. Uh, qualification helps not just us to protect our time, but also helps our clients and customers to become clearer about their own situation and perhaps yeah. some of the steps that they need to take. Yeah. Um, your time is your greatest asset and it's important to think, right, what's changed? Where are we now? What is the best use of our time? So rather than feeling frustrated about things that you can't do, think about the things that you can do. Yeah. And there's never been a better time to actually focus on working on the business rather than just in the business, mm. rather than feeling frustrated that you can't run across town for half a day with that buyer who you didn't qualify, who actually can't buy anything today. Yeah, <laughs> and, and there's a, a great opportunity here to be that trusted advisor. And rather than trying to convince people that they should be buying or they should be selling, work out who actually needs to sell, who actually needs to buy and help them. And um, I, I think the, the scenario that we're in right now is likely to be a challenging one for salespeople because we're not the first people to adapt. In the market, buyers create the market. Sellers are surprised by the market. The agent sits somewhere in the middle trying to make sense of it all. Make sure that you are not clouding purchases or vendors with your own opinions. Get out of it, be transparent, tell the truth. Make sure that you're not shielding the vendors from the market but at the same token, don't let the buyers pull the wool over your eyes. The first thing that's going to surprise some buyers is when they find themselves in competition. And that's a message that they're going to see and need to hear. You know what, with the, the beauty of being referred to a potential seller or being already the trusted person um, with the seller is sometimes the price conversation uh, is as quick as, um, so should we try to get as much as possible? Yep. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and do it. That, uh, you know, if you can get to a stage like that with, you know, the, uh, the regular sellers or what, whatnot, it's a really good place to be because um, no matter how it goes, it's, it's really hard for it to come back on you and for them to say, oh, you know, you, you said you could get this, but, you know, there, there isn't any of that. Um, as long as they're happy with your competency, then, you know, they'll know that you'll just put the property in the right position to, to get the uh, best value. So um, yes, I, in saying that with like regular um, appraisals, um, I, I do mention that, you know, unlike maybe five or 10 years ago where the purpose of getting an agent in is to figure out what your property is worth, um, you know, owners have access to tools online nowadays that just give them a really good idea already. Um, so I, I say, yeah, unlike, five or 10 years ago. Nowadays, um, our conversation, probably 10 or 15% of it would be about, oh, you know, what we can expect to sell the property for. It's, it's all the other stuff that's important, you know, how we go about doing it, um, that I find more useful uh, with the appraisal. And when you let them know this from the get go, then they know the price conversation will be a short one relative to the whole uh, conversation. So you kind of pre 
frame it by saying, hey, look, you know, I'm not here just to, to talk with you about what we may or may not get. It's, you know, that's a part of it. But, you know, a lot of the other stuff uh, is, is equally, if not more important. 100%, 100%. Mm. Uh, I think the analogy um, that I would use with a client who's really interested, say, yeah, yeah, sure, but please, we do need to know what you think it's worth. I'll tell you what, I'm happy to show you the recent sales and I, I want to make you aware of what you're competing against in the current market. Mm. You need to be aware that this is like driving a car looking in the rear vision mirror. Yeah. No, you're right. And I think... Um... I think using the um, recent sales and so with my appraisals, I've got the recent sales in there, but also the comparable properties that are currently on the market. Um, it's really hard for uh, a reasonable owner to argue against the cold hard uh, stats that you bring up. Um, yeah. And I think that's a good tool for, you know, for your uh, salesperson that you're training. Um, just to use that a part of the conversation, um, use some price ranges. Um, it's really hard to commit to just one number. So definitely use a price range. And you know, I mean, as long as everyone's reasonable, it should be okay. Totally. Yeah. And the, I, I think the, um, the critical elements here is that you've got to have trust. You need to focus on the process and what you can actually control. And when it comes to price, you have to demonstrate that you have the knowledge and the expertise about what's happening in the marketplace, but that realistically, you're not the buyer. You want to get them as much as possible. Should we go and do that? I, I, I've thought about this. Yeah. There are times where I lose uh, a, a listing to uh, an agent that just has a really refined, you know, they've got the, um, they went to, they've done dozens and dozens of hours of uh, appraisal training. And they've just, they know ex every dialogue at the right time. And they know exactly how to get the mum and dad owners at the right time, you know, saying the right things. And then they just close them, you know, on the spot there. Yes, I, I recognize that um, I sometimes lose out to those appraisals. But the ones that I do win, um, they're really good because they're the type um, that I think the compatibility, you know, the compatibility um, sometimes you just click with some owners and sometimes you just don't, if you know what I mean. Uh, I think um, making sure with the ones that you click with, um, getting their repeat business or referral um, makes up for sometimes losing out to the, uh, the flashier uh, appraisals. So that's, that's how I've kind of rationalized things, rightly or wrongly, but um, that's how I found. Uh, Daniel, I love that, mate. The reality coming out of that is that you get to deal with people who you do have a genuine connection with. Mm -hmm. And we both know that it's one thing to win a listing. It's quite another matter to sell it, especially in a tougher marketplace. Yeah. And by having people that trust you and that base their decision to choose you off an authentic connection and trust versus just a flashy sales pitch, well, they're, they're going to be easier to work with and you'll enjoy it more and they will refer you like you say. Yeah, I think uh, in saying that it, it is a bit of a numbers game, though. Um, it's probably uh, so from a business um, sustainability or profitability kind of uh, angle. It's important that you obviously get yourself in front of as many opportunities like this as possible so that um, it's not the end of the world if you miss out on one or two or however uh, totally. few because you've got the other opportunities um, so that's probably a big lesson to get the opportunities first um, as many as possible so that you uh, it doesn't hurt as much if you yeah, miss yeah. out on one or two uh, yeah that's that's, that's a big so one. true yeah. if you've got a huge pipeline and you've got business and you're winning it doesn't matter the ones that you lose don't matter because yeah. you've got plenty but if you don't have anything else lined up and you just had a couple of opportunities and you've missed them both yeah and yeah. that's a big dent to self-confidence and momentum. yeah correct correct so um a learning you know so it's it's all very well for me to say oh yeah don't worry about the ones that you're not compatible with but you can only not worry about them when you get enough um opportunities um so that's a yeah that's probably a big uh take from from what we're saying yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's important to know um, what the activities are that you control. 
that do provide leads and opportunities into that pipeline. Yeah, uh, what have you found works best for you? Um, so I would say 80% of my current business for the last uh, few years has been um, working with, um, you know, my developers, property traders that um, in all honesty, we're very loyal to one another. So there is actually a very steady flow I can rely on uh, in terms of listings there. Uh, and then the remaining 20% of my business, um, they come from referrals. Um, I, if I'm honest, I, I don't go out there and door knock very much, if at all, if I'm honest. Uh, but the, it's more referrals, um, you know, the opportunities that arise from just um, day-to-day real estate. Um, referrals, you know, people that uh, you meet that, you know, you click with, that kind of thing. So I'm probably not the best person on um, uh, providing best practice feedback for maximizing your pipeline, but this no, is just what's if working. If I listen you. to you, if I listen to you, what you're actually saying is you entered a business that had some momentum or had momentum and you brought your own dynamic to it and developed further opportunities from that. You did such a good job for those clients. They referred you to other people. That to me says you focus on keeping things simple, being a trusted advisor, doing the best for the people in front of you and maximizing the opportunities that sit within each of those times when you're meeting new people. So and that's I think a great thing talk- about business. Yeah. I think what we're talking about is sustainability um, of, of our business. So I think um, you know, everyone's business looks slightly different. Um, it's important that we just find our own way of uh, keeping a sustainable flow of business going. Um, again, relevant time to be talking about this with life for everyone, most people being on pause uh, at the moment. So uh, momentum, sustainability, these are all uh, key things that should be uh, on people's minds, especially as we head out of uh, level four lockdown very soon. So, yeah, good time to be chatting or thinking about these things. Uh, Thanks very much for joining us. Daniel, you're an absolute legend uh, and uh, look forward to seeing what happens over the next few weeks. Cheers, David.